Y'all, welcome back to Kentucky Fried Wargaming, where two guys who aren't qualified to talk about anything decide to talk about a game with hard math and chance. I'm Joe. And I'm John. And today, it's a very momentous occasion. We're bringing a guest on for the first time in the podcast history. Uh, everybody, bring it on Seth, our editor. Seth, say hi. Hi, y'all. Uh... We have convinced Seth to step out from behind his editing computer, largely through uh, the scam of this new Dark Eldar Codex, which I think is Xenos propaganda, and I will not tolerate it. But Seth was very excited, and uh, in fact knows way more about this Codex than either John or myself. So we thought it might be fun to uh, get into the specifics of it with someone who is veritably an expert by comparison yeah um, but being an expert and as you say the dirty space elves compared to you it's not saying a whole lot but i have been playing them since the end of seventh which anybody that knows dark eldar not a good time for them so i'm super hyped right about now <laughs> Yeah, um, I set a low bar, so low that you trip on it coming in the door, but alas, you still clear it. Um, we recently put out a, a couple of questions to the community on kind of what people would like to see from the podcast going forward. Uh, and largely, the response seems to be that people would like to see more specific topics for both 40k and AOS, covering you know specific armies, and in particular, the number one request was lore. And... That tickled John and I pink, because we never stop thinking about lore. So that is largely what we were excited to talk about today, is the lore of the Dark Eldar. Because to be honest, I I don't really know where they come from. I just kind of know that I hate them because Vulcan told me to, and he's <laughs> never wrong. Uh, however, before we jump into all that, uh, let's start with hobby time and games played. Uh, John, what have you been working on over the past week? So I haven't done a lot of painting or building, really. Um, been doing a lot of reading. <laughs> Read a, <laughs> been reading a lot of 40K and uh, mostly 40K books. Uh, but I've also been working on getting everything set up for Tabletop Simulator, downloading armies, building army lists, like trying out some stuff. And i uh, been playing a game with Joe here, like off and on. We've hey. been saving the state. Uh, it's uh, World Leaders vs. Custodies. That's been uh, a blast. I'm uh, pinning him into his deployment zone, like the mean man that I am. He sent three demon pterodactyls at me. Other dragons, thank you very much. The, those are pterodactyls. I don't have a degree in evolution ecology and organismal biology, but I do, and they are. Wait, are y'all talking about the hell turkeys? <laughs> I thought those were turkeys. Yeah, turkeys. Yes. It's all I up mean, for debate. Coming at you on the next episode. Are these hell turkeys, hell drakes, or hell pterodactyls? Um, yeah, it, we are currently at top of turn two. Uh, he has sent three of these giant metal chickens across the field into my lines. Look and at we, all them chickens. <laughs> we have stabbed them to death vigorously, but now we have to turn around and deal with the rest of the army that is behind them. Uh, and I'm really not sure how that's going to play out, but we're going to try to pick it up again over this coming week. Um, for me... I've done uh, some hobbying. I've actually been working on custodies. For most people out there know I've been working on the salamanders for a while now. And uh, I'm one of those people who I cannot paint the same thing forever. It just, it doesn't work for me. And I, I've never really been able to do it. Um, my motivation just sort of winds down after a while and my brain wanders. And I, for me, it's easier to just kind of follow that interest than to fight it. So after playing, what, two games with Custodes very recently over Tabletop Simulator, I, uh, I kind of got it in my head to maybe paint my own Custodes in, like, actual real space. And I have started on them before in a big blob of ten Custodian Guard, which I did not realize were so detailed of models. I mean, good God. <laughs> You'd love it. You love it, though. I Don't do, but I shouldn't have done it in a block of ten. I thought, like, oh, yeah, a batch of ten guys isn't bad. I was wrong. It was... Whew. Whew. I should have done it in fives. But anyway, 
I had started them once before and sort of got burned out and walked away. Uh, so I pulled them out this week and realized just how close they are to done. So uh, I have been working on those and I'll throw up uh, pictures on Instagram once they're completed. Uh, I'm going with a shadow keeper scheme. So it's not like the all gold that most of the custodies are. It's a uh, black Oromite armor and then like gold trims and stuff, which I think looks really, really cool with sort of a red to sort of like a fiery orange power weapons. And uh, I, I've been getting a lot of progress done on them pretty quickly, which is exciting. Uh, hopefully getting ready to put them on a table whenever COVID gets sort of winding down for us here in the States. Um, also, in terms of games played, like John mentioned, we are in a fierce battle <laughs> fighting his terrible, terrible world eaters versus my good golden boys of the Emperor. And I have no idea if we're going to be able to hold out and weather the storm, but trust me, when I know, you'll know. There will be a full breakdown of exactly who kicked whose butt and how. Uh, it's gonna be me kicking your butt. That's what's gonna happen. My golden posterior is far too armored with a two-up save for your kick to go through. I don't care. I got the perfect utensil to cut that cake. <laughs> You're a human. You're strength three. You're wounding me on fives, even if it does go through my two-up save. No, I got, I got I got strength five of them berserkers. Hide and watch. Strength six, actually. Yeah. Oh. Hide and watch. Yeah. Hide and watch. Yeah. I uh, I'm really not sure how it's gonna go, but I I can't wait to find out. Um. So to that end, Seth, what have you been working on this week? Uh, I've been working on getting hyped mostly. Like, I haven't really been painting or any of that, but trying to theory craft based off of leaks and stuff of what I even want to do with my Dark Elder at this point. Um, and just building some of the backlog that I've had, because yeah, boy's got some backlog. How much do you have? How big's your pile of shame? Uh, depends on how many factions we're talking about. Uh, it, it's, it's a healthy pile. I'll put it that way. It's a hefty pile. I thought I was yeah, going to pick up I see. some orcs at one point, so I got some of that new inbox. Just split the Daughters of Cain and Slanesh Demons box with a friend. Still got to build that. I still got some Blood of the Phoenix that uh, got put to the side for a little bit. <laughs> I see you're as cagey about your backlog as we are. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's rough. It's... Whew, that's why I really want these custodies off my plate, so I can at least say, haha, there are no custodies in my backlog. Like, Haha, <laughs> I did a thing. <laughs> while ignoring all everything else in the backlog. Um, but yeah, theory crafting off of, like, leaks and rumors, though, ooh, buddy, that's a dangerous game. Oh, yeah. But we're getting some spicy stuff, and it makes me happy, especially with the way that Marines are. It was a rough time there for a little bit. Uh, as someone who plays Tyranids, can confirm, still a rough time over here. It's, uh, that's a hard army to stack up against, especially some of the newer ones, like, uh, Dark Angels? Ow. Ow, ow, ow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dark Angels, pretty spicy. Anyways, I'm gonna build a Dark Angels list for you to play against a tabletop simulator, uh, Seth. We're gonna see how strong you are. <laughs> From everything where some creators have been getting their stuff early and doing reviews and whatnot, it's looking pretty spicy, not gonna lie. But there's still a lot of fun that you can do in ways to not just be a turbo chat about list building. Well, with that in mind, let's go ahead and dip right into talking about the Drukhari uh, from a lore perspective. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of the best place to pick up, because at least for me, when I'm sort of perusing for factions that I might want to play. The lore is the first thing I always stop at. Um, yep. And I think a lot of people out there listening probably also do the same. You know, if the lore is not compatible, they just probably mosey on. So Seth, sort of where do these like BDSM elves come from? Uh, well, they are, they were original Eldar before the fall of the Eldar when everyone kind of went their own ways. Cause like there was a giant splintering of the faction where the Exodites were like, hmm, no, we're, we're going to go over here. Y'all a little too hedonistic for us. 
and the craft worlds I mean, were like we're not going to go quite that far away but we're definitely going to rain our stuff in and then the dark out are just like nah welcome to the back of Nalia, y'all Ugh. and how did yeah. that work out for them <laughs> uh i mean they're still alive even though slanesh wants all of their souls and has laid claim to all of them and they at this point I guess not alive. That would be a good term. They're basically pain vampires. They literally subsist on the pain of others. So they're all sadistic space elves would be a better way to put them than BDSM space elves, I think. You, you know, you could have just said, did it work out well? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah, you could have just said, that? oops, birth to God. <laughs> Oopsie doopsie. <laughs> Sounds like that plan's not panning out for him. Y'all, our drug, <laughs> sex, and rock and roll just happened to birth a God. Like, that's pretty metal, though. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, what kills me is they literally, like, drug sex and rock and rolled their way into creating a new Chaos God that r almost ruined the galaxy. And then they went, you know how we get out of this? More drug sex and rock and roll. Let's just keep on going. What went wrong the first time can't happen again. And you know what's <laughs> even better about that, Joe? Not only did they what? do that, but their main city, Kamora, is built on a doorway to Slanesh's realm. They are literally oh. right on the doorstep. Just like, <laughs> bet. <laughs> Why? Why? Huh. Okay. And All right. That's a hell of a start to a tale, I guess. Yeah. And so, like, talking to Kamagra, Kamagra was a old, like, port city in the webway. Uh, way back when the Eldari Empire still existed before it collapsed. And it's just like a sprawling urban nightmare now where it's just got, it is a micro, it is a pocket dimension within a pocket dimension that has pocket dimensions within it. And uh, it's just a nightmare place. It's full of all sorts of like wild stuff and it's changed the biology of them as an Eldar race. Like the, their lack of using psychic powers means they can't harness psychic powers anymore. They can see in the dark, have heightened senses, heightened uh, physical capabilities because of the the constant infighting they're dealing with. Like it's a it's very interesting, like little sub cosmo like like sub community that they are dealing with with constant like gang warfare and everything else. I mean, I I, I don't want to crap on pocketception or anything, but like. How it? I get the. I have the same questions about this as I do when like I read the D and D novels about like the dark elf cities there, and how like maliciously cruel they are. How does anyone survive there? Well, the the answer here is that uh, there's two types of of uh, dark eldar essentially. Uh, there are halfborn, uh, which are grown in vats, um, and they don't have parents like they're just genetically grown so that the race doesn't die and they're kind of just left to figure out how to survive like figure it out and then there's true born which are essentially like nobility where if you can actually have a child you're seen as like a higher social standing like the, you, the child that is actually born from two dark eldar parents is actually seen as like a uh, re like revered as a figure in the lore which is kind of an interesting way like take on it Interesting. So I'm I'm assuming that the sort of well, I can't call it a planet. Uh, I'm a city pocket city. City is, pro city is probably the best. Okay, we'll uh, go with city term. So I'm assuming the city is run by all of these uh, trueborns and nobles. Um, so what's sort of their trade like? I mean, what are they like? What are their resources from? Do so they, the do they make anything or? They they do. So where the Eldar use their psychic powers to kind of like manifest their their gear, like their equipment, their weapons, their their everything. The Jukari actually have to build everything. They have manufactorums essentially, uh, that are ran via slave labor and half born labor. Um the slave labor is stuff that they get from the raiding parties, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um but their society is based along the concept of if you can get it, if you can take it, it's yours. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, we'll talk about Vect, right? Vect, as a character, was born half-born, was not born true-born, and is now in charge of the all of Kamagra. 
he, you know, he, he, he took over the whole thing. Uh, did, I'm assuming he murdered his way there. Uh, kind of. A, a lot of it was just um, machinations. Like he, he was just very clever. He's not a very like he's a good fighter. Don't get me wrong. He's a very powerful character, uh, but he's not like godlike level. He just outsmarted a lot of everyone and kind of played on the natural arrogance of the Drakari. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, sort of Jarlaxel ish. Yeah, yeah, and so. One of the major tenets of trade, I suppose, with Dark Eldar is that they go on these things called raiding parties. And all D Dark Eldar want to go on these. It is a prized ability to go into real space. And in real space, that's where like you'll see whole fleets of Dark Eldar ships and raiders and venoms and everything else flying into like imperial worlds and taking a bunch of people kidnapping them causing mayhem and pain and everything else it's a it's a fun event for them <laughs> as weird as that sounds and then they bring all those slaves back and they you they you know trade the slaves amongst each other and they trade like the characters like the, the characters the um the relics that they get because they'll steal stuff too like they'll take like imperial relics or like old xenos relics stuff like that and they'll use that to trade amongst each other uh it's a very insular community and it's all kind of falling apart constantly yeah don't it say is, <laughs> it's not it's not prospering in any manner of the term you're telling me that just wanted cruelty is it a great foundation for government yeah right <laughs> uh so vect like we were talking about him and who vect is is for the the Dark Elder is basically the head of the faction. He is like the most noticeable character. He doesn't have a model yet. He used to. He doesn't have rules yet. He used to. Uh, he's a very, very fun guy, I guess. <laughs> he's interesting to, to think about in the same way that like anti like anti heroes and villains are. Because the Dark Elder are a villainous faction. They are not heroes. They're evil. Oh, far from being heroes. Yeah, yeah, and so <laughs> even like, not even anti heroes. <laughs> no, a story you're gonna love, Joe. So okay, Vect, right? He really. I have wants a feeling take... I'm not gonna love this. Just you, 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 you're gonna love this. You're, you're gonna I... love it. Okay. So Vect wants to take over all of Kamagra, and but the 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 major players are in his way. All of the the heads of Kamagra are mm -hmm. stopping him. They're in charge of all the Manifactorums, they're in charge of all the slave pits, they're in charge of everything. And he really wants to remove them from power. So he does some some research and has some spies go out into the real space for him. He had, you know, he's got a bunch of mercenaries at work for him, and he finds out that there are a bunch there's a salamander's battle barge very close to a webway portal. Go on. Yeah, yeah. And so he purposefully lures the salamander's battle barge into Kamagra, into the main heart of the city where the salamanders proceed to activate their distress signal and get more salamanders to show up and so the salamanders <laughs> go to war with the dark eldar in the middle of Kamagra, specifically all of the heads of Kamagra, while vect takes all of his men and all of his people and kind of retreats like like uh, like deeper into Kamagra in a place where the salamanders are going to get to him, and just kind of let the salamanders murder, like just let the <laughs> salamanders kill a bunch of dark elves, uh, including like detonating a battle barge. Like they they, they destroy like a huge portion of Kamagra, and then they just escape out. Like they just leave. <laughs> <laughs> Like they just get out and they just kill over. And Vect goes, ah, yes, thank you, Salamanders. You did exactly what I wanted you to. Now I'm in charge. And takes advantage of the power vacuum to sit upon the throne, essentially. And uh, now dictates how everything works. I mean, I gotta hand it to him. Game recognizes game. It's a brilliant plan. Yeah. If there's very, one thing a Salamander smart. is going to do, it is kill Dark Eldar. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is their most viled enemy. And Seth, yeah. why, why is that? Why is that? Yeah, you know. what? Why do the goodest boys of the Imperium hate the evil, sadistic space elves? I, th I thought that yeah, one was pretty yeah. self-explanatory there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, fun fact for everybody out there, that's actually kind of 
Seth's Dark Eldar is my Salamander's sort of like rival uh, faction. Um, because of, in the lore, that was Vulcan's first like enemy was the Dark Eldar. That was how he was introduced to the wider galaxy. Um, he fell on a planet called Nocturne and was taken in by a blacksmith who raised and loved him. And then one night while they were sleeping, uh, a raiding party came in of these pale elves who started taking people. Uh, and that was the first time he ever went into combat. He grabbed his blacksmith's hammer, stepped outside, and started swinging. Um, and from that day forth, they have had a terrible rivalry, which only makes Vex plan more clever. Like, that's just 5D chess. Yes, it, Vect is the king of 5D chess. It's very impressive. Uh, the only yeah. time his power was ever sort of in danger was when uh, the birth of Yaneid and when Yunari came out and like the Cain's Gate, which is the portal slash kind of opened <laughs> and uh, demons poured out and like Vect was like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I can use this. Uh, I've got some political rivals that need to die. I'm just going to let them come out a little bit further and kill all those dudes. I'm going to step back. Oh, no, it's getting real bad. We got to we got to go back. <laughs> and then he he kind of like was able to shut it back with help of the Incubi and put it back. But it's still it was a uh, kind of earth shattering for the Drukhari. So, kind of, so I know that just from the models, there are a few different sort of uh, sub-societies to Kamarga or Kamara. Where exactly do those come in in the lore and in the army? Like, I have seen these big hulking abominations uh, in ter for models, as well as like these small murderous dark elf ladies i mean like where do those different things fit in so uh most of the dark elf like the dark eldar stuff can be broken down into four sections uh the cabals which is uh was started by vect like the whole concept of cabals was started by vect of like a uh, a mixture between like a paramilitary organization and like a crime organization right seth yeah uh, they're, like you said, they're basically your military foot soldiers and enforcement officers for the most part for the Archons, which Vect is an Archon. He's like the big Archon, but there's other okay. Archons that have smaller control in the city. Okay, so sort of like general foot troops? Yeah, they're your rank and flank. They're the guys that are trained with the rifles to shoot for the most part. They're basically just there to do that job. Rank and flank is a wonderful term. I I don't think I've heard that before. It, it's it's rocking my world over here. <laughs> I'm loving it. <laughs> and then, uh, but then after those, you get into like your witch cults, which are primarily females, and the not all, entirely, but like your witches, which are one of the main core units for the codex, also are primarily female and they're basically gladiators and they fight oh, for sport okay. and for entertainment for the city and then you have a succubus that leads them but then on top of just the witches in there too you don't just have that you also have beast masters which wrangle beasts for people to fight in the arena and then you also have your Reavers and your Hellions, which are more like gangs in Kimura. Even GW came out with a thing called Gangs of Kimura, for those that remember that back in 8th edition. And they do different sports, like, because the Reavers are jet bikers that just race around. And then the Hellions, probably my favorite unit in the entire Codex, are just like skateboard gangs just all kinds of craziness going on there just like skateboard thug ex gangs it sounds extraordinarily 90s except they're <laughs> like and even more 90s they're not traditional skateboards they're all on like green goblin hoverboards 
Of course they are. <laughs> I'm only going to picture all of your hellions as Willem Dafoe for the rest of time. <laughs> Every time they have a friendly fire incident, he just shouts, no, no, Peter, it's me. <laughs> Pretty much. I'm something of a witch cult myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so if that's, if that's the green goblin, then where do this like killer croc looking guys come in? Like, I have seen models with like these big bulbous musculature structures and these full face masks with like tubes coming all out of them. Oh, like is like that the another BDSM sort of looking bodyguard dudes? Yeah, yeah, kind of like a tank from Left for Dead meets like a leather daddy convention. Like <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an apt description for sure. Um, but that's the homunculus covens, which okay. are traditionally led by a homunculus who are. Experts and flesh crafting. So they oh, they're I the ones like word. John was saying, uh, are doing the like DNA vats and creating things, but as a villainous evil space self group is going to do, they're not playing by the rules. They're making whatever they want. Even to the point that uh for those that know Fabius Bile who got a recent update not too long ago, was actually an honored guest to Kimura to study and learn and share information back and forth, which is not a thing for Kimura at all. If you're not a Drukari or a Eldari in general, there's only traditionally one way that you're getting into Kimura and you're probably not leaving. I mean, unless you're Fabius Bile, who is sort of like the master genetic manipulator of the galaxy, I guess it would be worth sort of bringing him in to poke his brain a little. Maybe I literally, mean, for all I know. Mm -hmm. And there's even like a Primarch hanging out in uh, Kamigra. Like, the Khan is supposedly in Kamigra right now, like just riding around on his motorbike fighting uh, Reavers and, and uh, Hellions and stuff in the streets. I could see that. Yeah, I know that he, like, drove off into the webway to start hunting down Eldar. Uh, so I would not be surprised if he is still in there hunting Eldar. Because <laughs> I mean, time gets con. weird. Yeah, the con just is like, uh, I kind of live for two things. Driving fast and winning. And uh, I haven't gotten rid of all the elves, so I haven't won yet. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's got to deal with all these nerds on their hover bikes and their hover skateboards just flying around in circles around him as he's just screaming. I'm just picturing him doing a wheelie into a webway portal, putting on glasses, going, Cowabunga it is. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Horus Heresy? Lost. This webway, though? Not yet. Here we go! Oof. But then after the homunculus covens which has all of their flesh crafted mutations and monsters all of that stuff then you also have blades for hire which are not necessarily drukari some of them are but they don't like they're a side piece they're not a part of the main foundation so you have like the incubi who are some sort of Eldari, whether they're actually Drukari or not, they don't take off their masks, it's hard to tell, which are led by Trazar, who uh, is, we think, was originally a leader for a Craftworlds faction, but we haven't gotten concrete evidence on that yet. Um, your Scourges, which are winged Drukari, from flesh crafting and stuff. They just had wings implanted on them. Here you go. You're our jump infantry. You're going to go do some weird shit. Ugh, I hate it. And then you also have... Oh, why am I drawing a blank on their name right now? Scroll faster! Mandrakes. Which are effectively a warp entity, I believe. They're not true Kari at all. They are an entirely different race that is almost demonic, but they feed and function similarly to the Drukari, so they just tend to work together. Kind of like the Enslavers, like the old Xenos race. Mm hmm. And there's some spoopy stuff going on with the Mandrakes, dipping in and out of shadows, teleporting and stuff. It, it, it's wild. 
Yeah, this sounds like awful Xenos her- heresy. I hate it. Like when 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 people say purge the Xenos, they're they're probably talking about the Dark Eldar. They're not talking about Craft Worlds. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they're also talking about Craft Worlds, but <laughs> at least the Craft World have sort of a. There's a argument to be made that like, no, they've actually done some good, but the Drakari seem to sort of revel in their lack of. Uh, how would I put it? Altruism Empathy. for the galaxy? Like, they seem to only be in it for themselves, largely because they're so scared to die. Oh, entirely. Like, there's even a uh, story where, the because Trukari and Craft Worlds have a tentative agreement that they'll help each other out sometimes, because... At the end of the day, they're actually all the same race. Let's not all die. That'd be great. But -hmm. there was a story where I want to say it was Craft World Eandon, which does not have many elves left. They're mostly wraith constructs powered by their spirit stones, all that. That were getting attacked by Tyranids and losing hard. Like this Craft World was about to actually get completely overrun. But then a Drukari faction came out and helped them. And at the end, like, craft worlds don't really like using their wraith constructs because it's necromancy that feels bad. No, we don't like that. But when the craft world asked, why did you come and help us? The Drukari were just like, we like watching you in pain from using those things. So it just kind of helped us out too. Now we're going to go fuck off over here again later. Ugh. What yeah. unbearable douches. Uh, See, uh, douches. I mean, they do <laughs> make a great antagonist, sunset. though. Like, I gotta hand it to them. They're a great antagonist to put anything up against. Mm-hmm. It's um, also that they, they, they show a really interesting side to the whole Eldari, like, section of the lore. Of They kind of are the mirror image to Shehu Thirst, uh, also known as Slanesh. Like, they... They are very close to being Slanesh, like, flavored. Like, they, they act very similar to Slaneshi demons. They act very similar to, like, Slaneshi followers. But they haven't fully fallen to that. But they kind of have. And it's like a mere darkly kind of thing. Can, can you say they haven't fallen to that when they're the reason that that exists? I mean, that's <laughs> fair. Uh, I, mean, I think like, they fell when they made it. There's lots of, of like, references from different craft world stuff about the Dark Eldar, how, like, the, the craft worlds kind of see the Dark Eldar as the scared children who don't want to accept the inevitability of their fate. And so they're willing to sacrifice other people to not have to look at that, which is a very interesting, like, takeaway. I mean, I think, we, like, while this is definitely punched up for the fantasy setting... I think we've all met people who are kind of like that, who kind of, they'll have a moment where they get, a, for whatever reason, a glimpse of their existential mortality and that they will not last forever. And instead of kind of turn, turning into it and dealing with it, they just sort of, nope, not looking at that, distracting myself for perpetuity. And I think this is a fun play on that. Mm-hmm. Fun's a strong word. I mean... <laughs> it's, I'm it's gonna call it fun. It. it is a play. <laughs> it's a take. <laughs> it is a horrifying take. Um. All right. So if that's what they've been doing, sort of, what are they up to now? Like, because I think there's a ton of content creators who have covered like all of the background lore of this faction and the nitty gritty. And for folks out there listening, if you're looking for that, uh, there are a number of content creators who have put all that stuff out down to the wire. But I think the question that is kind of more pertinent now is, as of today, at the end of March in 2021, what are their goals? Or sort of where do they fit in the overarching narrative of Ninth Edition? So, one, like, there's a new supplement coming out. And there's some stuff going on with the supplement, but it's called the Book of Rust. And they, that's where Lilith is coming back. And there's a Piety and Pain box set coming to show it too, with like, like Lilith versus, uh, sisters, like Dark Eldar versus sisters of battle. And it seems to be that the Dark Eldar are taking a more direct approach of interceding between in conflicts. 
uh, between the Imperium and Chaos. So, like, the D- Death Guard and Adeptus Mechanicus are about to, like, duke it out on this planet, right? Mm-hmm. And the Del- Dark Elder seem to be showing up and doing more than just taking slaves. Like, they, like they're like they taking slaves and terrorizing people as normal, but there seems to be a grander plan being done there from Lilith, somehow. And we don't really know what that's like yet. And it kind of ties into stuff that Vect's been doing, because, like, Vect has been coalescing and, and strengthening his power blocks within Kamagra, but to what end? Like, it, it seems like the, the faction as a whole doesn't have, like, an end goal or, like, a really, like like concrete thing they're trying to do which makes sense considering who they are but it definitely seems like vect does and lilith being like kind of his right hand lady um has a plan of her own not to mention that vect made some enemies along the way especially one in a uh, was it correct me if i'm wrong seth but isn't it lady malice probably yeah like lady malice who like Woe goes into the webway, meets some different, like, characters, and kind of meets an old, like, the fragment of an old Eldari god, and is, like, coming back to try to kill Vect. Like, that's wild. And dealing with all of that, there's also the Yonari, which are a mixed force of Eldar, where it's got Harlequins, you know, Craftworlds, and Drukhari working together to kind of resurrect this god of the dead to take on Slanesh, to, to, to bring in a new age for the Eldar race, which Vect is having to contend with that because he's losing people to it. Like, people are leaving the Kamagra to go work with uh, the Yanari. And th- there's a lot going on there, and I think that the political nature of the Eldar and the mysterious clandestine nature of the Eldar factions kind of plays into their their place where Dark Eldar aren't really messing with the Imperium and Chaos too much, but they are definitely messing with their own race a lot, which is an interesting part of it. Mm-hmm. And the, like, even just by messing with their own race, because they're so intrinsically tied to some of the Chaos gods and whatnot... And messes with everything else as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. Because a race not only like birthing Slanesh, but then resurrecting a god of death. That's going to be some wild stuff, y'all. Yeah, like even in with a race that's so close to extinction, they're capable of such crazy things is kind of huge. Uh, and there's all sorts of weird stuff that can happen in the future of the setting with them as a faction. Uh, not to mention that Dark Eldar technology is some of the best in the, in the galaxy. Um, it it's it transcends like even the oldest days of the Imperium. Like they've got stuff from before humankind existed. They still have it. They've got stuff from like the War in Heaven. Like Dark Eldar can just make wild stuff. Like the uh, little tidbit, little fun fact: the Emperor's Throne is actually Eldari technology. That at some point the Inquisition had to make a deal with the Dark Eldar to like have them come look at it. To be like, hey, I think you're uh you're you need a new suspension on this truck. <laughs> like Hey, but your soul compressor's out. Did you know that? Like <laughs> I I love it. It sounds like they're they could potentially be a big player if they just stop fighting each other for ten minutes. Or if Vec just completely takes over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> If yeah, Vect if takes some... over, that would be absolutely huge because he's one of the few that we have at least been written about that actually has plans and actually has machinations and isn't just taking drugs and going to mass orgies when they're not raiding other places. Yeah, it's somebody with a vision, which could be very beneficial for them as a race. Or very so... destructive, depending on how it goes. We'll find out. I mean... It would be good for the Dark Eldar. It would be awful for everyone else. And as, you know, a loyal son of Vulcan, I hate it. But, you know. Good. Your hate fuels us. Ah! I only hate it more. Uh, wait, no. I, ah! Moving on. So, uh, <laughs> we have, we've touched, uh, like, the lore bits at, like, a, a higher view. But I know also this book retouched a lot of the mechanics as well as sort of refluffing the lore 
So I think that's kind of where I want to go next. Now, obviously, do not worry, listeners. We are not a heavy competitive channel. We are not going to throw a bunch of math at you. We aren't even going to throw very specific lists at you of what you should be playing. Because that's that's not our speed. However, I think there's value in talking about sort of what has changed and maybe what might be a good place to start for you to build up from. Well, I think one of the best places to start is just with Trukari being three factions in a trench coat, four if you count Blades for Hire as well, the detachments were really restrictive in 8th edition of even what you could do with them. And it made list building a pain just on a fundamental level, unless you were really heavy into like, I'm a Cabal player, I'm a Witch Cult player, I'm a Covens player. But now we don't really have to deal with that. We have two special rules for our fundamental list building. Whereas if we take nothing but patrols, they do not cost us CP at all. That's, that's big. None that's of them? Good. Not a single one, as long as we only use patrol detachments. Oh, crap. And then, okay, that, that's wild. And then on top of that, we have another one that is called Real Space Raids, which is a little bit more restrictive, but you get some cool benefits with it. That in order to take a Real Space Raid, you have to have one Archon, one Succubus, and one Homunculus, along with one unit of Cobblites, one unit of Witches, and one unit of Rax, which is the Coven's troop slot. And then they all get their separate obsessions. There's no penalties for doing that like you normally would if, say, you were running Salamanders and Raven Guard in a list together. They would lose some abilities. Yet yeah, none of that. Mm -hmm. We get our, to have our cake and eat it too there. Okay, that's a clever rule set up by GW to make sure that you can pull from the different cults without necessarily tying your shoelaces before you start running that race. Yep. Um... And you won't, and also you won't gimp yourself on CP. Oh, like, for sure. That really helps your flexibility. And Dark Eldar are a tricky army. Like, we love our little tricks and just odd CP abilities to use. And your opponent a lot of times is just like, wait, what? That That's so niche of a thing to do, but yeah, that that's annoying. Okay, carry on. Yeah, and you guys are heavy on transports too, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a real space raid. We got to have our pirate ships to go raiding with, right? Yeah, and wasn't one of the major changes in the 9th edition something with the transport capacity? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. So, through we have our raiders and our venoms. Our raiders, which are our like, pirate boat-looking ones, they used to only hold 10. Which, okay, whatever, you could take, like, a nine-man squad and then put a character in there. But you never really saw that ever. What you saw was our Venoms, which are, like, little smaller five-man slots. But then you never could put a character in them, and we're traditionally an army that, no, everything goes in a boat. We're squishy, everything hide in the boat, so that way we can go raid this place. Everyone, hop in, get your snacks, let's go. We got 17 pontoon boats and we're going to take down the Gulf of Mexico. Woohoo! Pretty much. <laughs> and then you ran into this awkward thing to where, oh yeah, all my HQs, they have to take their own special boat because they're special and they can't ride with anybody else because they're too good. But now we got a huge update to where our raiders are capacity 11 and our Venoms are capacity 6. We must have learned something from the Harlequins at some point, because they already had that technology. Don't know how we figured out how to get an extra person in there, but we did it. I think the secret is a little uh, place in England. Uh, Nottingham, maybe. Like a, just a guy who wrote it off his paper and solved the, the math. Dark Eldar. Right. <laughs> hey, this is a huge pain point. Maybe we should just, uh, yeah, let's fix that. Thank you. What if we just got rid of it? What if we just got rid of it? What if it just worked? Like, <laughs> pretty much. Un unlike Fallout 76, it does just work now. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that change. It's very small, and I think a lot of people would miss it from the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. But just being able to throw an HQ in there with your troop really increases your viability on the battlefield when you send that boat up to sit on an objective or get in the back lines. 
And then also a giant quality of life thing that we got was traditionally from the lore, Dark Eldar are really good in combat. We don't want to just be peppering you with our splinter rounds from forever away. We don't get to revel in your pain if we do that. We want to be up close and personal. But we hit like wet noodles. Well, now our melee is surprisingly good. Even things that you wouldn't think are good in melee, like our Kabbalites, who are our rank and flank gunners, they got an extra attack. Our, even our transports, a raider has like six attacks if you take a small upgrade. And it's not hitting on sixes like most are, it's hitting on fours. Combat boats. Combat, Combat boats. boats. I'm going to ram you with my boat, and you ain't going to like it. I'm here for it. I'm here to ba uh, battle boat sounds awesome. But by far the well, biggest, like, with the combat efficiency, witches, they were this awkward, like, toughness three, but blob to hold things in place, but still hit like a wet noodle. And y'all, tell me why professional gladiators would get into a ring and not actually damage things. Like, just, no. I mean, I'd argue they wouldn't. And now they are blenders. Like, they mean. They still toughness three. Like, you look at them wrong, they go poof. But they're mean. Well, I mean, it sounds like they play much more on the tabletop how you would expect them to in your head. Oh, entirely. Which, you know, I'm always a fan when you can cut down on the ludonarrative dissonance. Because, um, like, any time that something doesn't line up to how it's, like, the description in the army book reads it. Um, it always bothers me. So I am real glad they made that change. Mm -hmm. And it definitely plays better with the lore because if we're going out to raid something, we don't want to hit them full force. No, we want to weaken a section and then go in and scoop up stragglers that are left behind. So that way we can just get slaves easier. It's part of well, our workforce. Also, it's like, part of everything. And it's also bad business. Like... If you just wipe everything out and like every time you raid it, you can't come back to there and raid it again later because you just scorched the earth. Yeah. Um, it, it makes more horrible, horrible sense to not wipe it clean, but to leave survivors like hit them hard immediately and then just come back through for sure. And it, I hate it. Like this book just gets rid of pretty much all of the like dissonance between lore and rules and it just feels so good well with all that in mind like you obviously have thought about like theory crafting for this army what what core like what is your focus on list building going into this what for if you're gonna sit down and play like a narrative game with me like a fun kind of casual game what's the core you would bring and then like to tack stuff onto I mean, I'm going with the real space raid detachment probably every time at this point. Like, that's just too good, too fluffy. Are there spikier lists that you can make with the patrol detachments? Probably. Do I care? Not really. Like, I'm just going to start off with those six units right there. And then also, we got new rules to where we can upgrade some of those to be stronger versions because those that were fans in 7th edition, we got Trueborn Kabbalites and Blood Bride, which is back, just not the way they were, which I'm fine with that, whatever. But we got them back. You just have to pay a couple of upgrade points and then we have better Kabbalites and we have better witches and probably doing that. And even the Covens, there wasn't a version of that for Rax, but now we got a version and they beefy. Beefy lads. Now, like you, so you have the troops and the HQ slots down. Uh, what like tack on special units do you, do you personally favor? Oh, give me Reavers and Hellions. I, I want to go fast. Let me go fast and have my, like, gang lords just going around smacking people. So, like, I've heard Hellions got better, but, like, are they, like, pow like super powerful now? Or are they just, like, nice, even keel power? Like, how'd they get there? Uh, I would say they're really good right now. And there's some stuff. There's one thing that I'm honestly expecting an FAQ to nerf back. Because they've kind of done that with other things in the past. 
but they got an extra toughness. So they're not T3. Their hoverboard now acts like a jet bike when it comes to toughness. They're T4 flying elves. And they got, like most of the units, they got more attacks. I think they got another armor save, but don't quote me on that one. They're just really strong. And then because they got that extra toughness, everything moves fast. Like, you can give them more drugs now, which is a huge thing with the witch cults. They all just take drugs to get better stats. Like, gotta go fast. Take that drug. Need to be stronger. Oh yeah, take that drug. They're just a really solid unit at this point, I believe. Still got a test to find out, but even if they're not, I was trying to make them work in 8th edition. I'm still going to try to make yeah. them work. Yeah, and it sounds like the the book added flexibility in those units where there's more you can do with them than just take them, give them weapon A or weapon B. Like, the combat drugs thing sounds like a fun way of, like, tailoring them to different situations in or different strategies so that you can use one unit multiple ways when list building which i think is very good especially in a casual setting if you need to tone it up or tone it down oh for sure and like now none of the drugs are bad because there used to be one that it was just here's plus one <laughs> leadership like, Someone clip that. Like, none of the drugs are bad. I Kentucky mean, Fried War Gaming 2021. <laughs> none of the dark elf drugs are bad. Let me let me refix that one there. <laughs> Kids don't do drugs. But now, uh, like none of them are really bad, so you can more freely like it used to be you had to either pick or gamble on what drug you would take per unit. But if you picked one drug, you couldn't use that again until you had used all of them. Now you can just pick, or to gamble, you can roll twice and get two drugs. Uh, you seem like the kind of fella who would be gambling all the time. Oh yeah, give me two drugs. As far <laughs> as Dark Eldar care, <laughs> the more, the better. I that's got like two playing, hands. <laughs> that's like playing Skaven and not rolling the dice every time. Like, yeah. You, you gotta. You gotta. Dark Eldar are just going to be playing Edward Forty Hands with their drugs. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, all right. All I right. love it. All right, a bunch of super pale bath salts zombies. I'm here for it. Yep. Yeah, the it. bath salts, and then you got the weed over here, and you got, you name it, Dark Eldar probably got it, and they probably got stuff you couldn't even name, because, well, they had to birth a god somehow, right? Um, they are also like ancient deities from a time before. Like, oh, for sure, they're, they're from they're old as dirt, older than dirt. Actually, probably oh, are older than some of the planets, so yeah, they are yeah. older than dirt. Yeah, they are older than dirt. But uh, Seth, kind of like listening to all this, it sounds like the Codex is a big win overall. Oh it yeah, do, it doesn't like as we were kind of going through the lore into the rules. It doesn't sound like there are very many sticking points. The oh. that they sort of made a misstep on. And the only sticking points is, like I was saying, previously you were like a Cabal player, a Witch Cult player, or a Covens player. And some of the changes to their core rules, because one that we haven't talked about yet is the power from pain table, to where as the turns go on, you get stacking benefits. Well, that kind of got reworked, and the way that it got reworked kind of treaded on the toes of the Covens, and then they tried to fix that, but not really. So if you're like a main Covens player, eh, kind of a little bit of a sticking point, still good. Do not get me wrong, but not the way that they exactly were. But if you're a Cabal or a Witch Cult player, always looking real good, real, real good. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a, a pretty much slam dunk of a book for all the Dark Elf players. And I can at least say, I mean, obviously we're recording this really early to try to get it out for people, but... Kind of looking at the forums and the Facebook groups, people seem really happy with it. Mm -hmm. And it is it is a breath of fresh air to be able to look around the hobby and see a bunch of people really happy with the new codex. Because it is, well, it is not always that positive. We'll put it that way. And um, I really hope like the quality and the interplay of the this codex, like it plays really nicely together, got rid of a lot of the sticking points. And I hope I see that trend continue for other codexes, because I want everybody else to be as happy as I am with this book. 
I mean, oh, it's yeah. two for two on Xenos Factions with ninth edition books so far. Mm-hmm. They've both been pretty, pretty great. Whoever wrote this, keep them employed, please. Just have them write more. <laughs> and and never hire Matt Ward back ever. Please, no. I don't need seventh edition again. Yeah, I mean, it gives me hope for some of the other Xenos Factions that are still waiting. You know, for the for the Eldar proper, the Harlequins, uh, the Tyranids, the Orcs, the Tau... Man, we have a lot of factions who still don't have a codex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it gives me hope for some of those factions. Orcs coming and soon, I, though, with them Savage Boys. Looking interesting. Uh, so tempted. The friggin' squig grabbers? Ugh. I do not need orcs. I do not need orcs. I do not need orcs. Do you already have gobbas? What What's getting some orcs there, Joe? I cannot play a third horde army, Seth. I can't do it. I mean, my mind I mean, cannot take it. I got some orcs already. If you want some, no, I my mind cannot take it. Play Imperial Knights then. You're already playing Custodes. Like, just go from like one small Modicon army to another small Modicon army. You'll be all right. Ugh, the rules you... are in a rough place. Although, if they get a codex like this, I might pull the trigger. Like that, that just might be a thing. Um, yeah. And this gives me hope that they might get a codex this good. Like. I think going into this, we were all kind of bracing ourselves, like, oh god, are, are the Xenoths going to end up as good as the Space Marines? And I'm really happy to see that all that worry was for nothing. Mm-hmm. And I will say one thing that I've noticed at looking through some of the data slates and stuff, a lot of the upgrades we got were in direct correlation with what Primaris are. So, like, we got plus one armor in a lot of cases to mitigate that minus one AP on most bolters, along Mm -hmm. with a lot of our weapons got upgraded to damage two to be able to deal with Primaris Marines instead of just being like, I can't kill this many wounds, what is due? Yeah, and even old Marines are two wounds now, so, like, that is an important adjustment to kind of bring the book up to level. Mm -hmm. All the Death Guard Marines are two wounds, I'm waiting patiently for world leaders to get two wounds and their own book, GW. Mm -hmm. Just give me two wound berserkers. You could keep praying, John. Keep the faith. Keep the angry, angry faith. But uh, yeah, I think this book is definitely sort of increased my faith in GW for at least the 40k side of things going forward. Um, I still don't like the how long we have to wait to get a codex, but uh, it, this makes me a little more assured that the wait will be worth it once we get there. Um, although I think, holy crap, we've been recording for almost an hour now, and it feels like we just started. But um, before we sort of roll out of here, Seth, thanks for coming on and hopping out from behind the editing chair. We appreciate it, because if it was just me talking about Dark Eldar, this episode would have been about 15 minutes. Yeah, and, um, and most of that would have just been you repeating dirty Xeno scum repetitively. I'm not wrong <laughs> for the record. I mean, have um, you seen our paint jobs? We're very crisp and clean. Just saying. Look at them edge highlights. There's, yeah, but there's like human flesh covered in gore through, strewn across them. Just like, because Dark Eldar... the Archon has a cape made out of a patchwork of random flesh bits, including one that still has a face on it. That uh, uh, Details. Details. No, That's a big detail. That's a big detail. Dark Eldar are the exemplification of the phrase fresh to death. What? Yes. <laughs> that's what they are. <laughs> Ugh. It only makes me hate them more. Um, but I I do appreciate you coming on, Seth. It definitely made the conversation a little more interesting. And for folks out there, I hope it was more interesting for you. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to send it out there that, you know, this is our first episode diving into a specific faction. Uh, so your feedback would be appreciated. Um, you know, we obviously got some responses that this is what people wanted to hear. But is there any changes that you'd like to this formula or any factions you would like covered in particular or brought towards the front? Uh, All of that stuff we are very open to and we'd love to hear it. it. We started this to get you guys the content you want and anything you can give us as to what you're looking for, we'll take and run with. But for now, I think that's been all of our opinions. Bonafide, Kentucky Fried. We'll see y'all next time.